What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. You know, um, Rudy, I love learning about how people helped build household name brands. Okay, and I've Rudy Maurer today. Uh, I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna introduce you, Rudy, in a second. But you know, I've had Nolan Bushnell. He talked about Atari and Chuck E. Cheese. Tony Horton of P90X. Rick Sassari, who helped grow companies like George Foreman Grill, Juice Man Juicer, OxyClean, Sonicare. So check those episodes out. Before I introduce today's guest, um, who I've known for a while, Rudy. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise Twenty Five, which I co-founded with my business partner John Corcoran. At Rise Twenty Five, we help businesses. Um, really give to their best relationships, connect to their best relationships um, by running your podcast. So we help people launch and run podcasts. Since 2008, I've been podcasting and working with other podcasters. And really, for me, relationships are the number one thing in my life. And I always look at ways to give to my best relationship and you know, profiling my favorite people, their thought leadership and what they're working on is always something that's top of mind for me. So if you want to learn more, go to rise25.com and check that out. Without further ado, we have Rudy Moore, and he is the CEO of Pier One. He's investor advisor for retail e-commerce ventures. He's, it's run by Ty Lopez and Alex Moore, and their holdings include Pier One, Radio Shack, Dress Barn, Steinmart, Franklin Mint, Lins and Things, and many more and growing. And he's also founded ROI Machines, because he's not busy enough, which is a digital agency that helps companies in in some cases get Rudy tens of thousands of leads with paid ads, setting up everything needed for a funnel from design, development, copywriting, and much more. And his past life was an elite sports nutritionist and trainer working with Hollywood celebrities, elite athletes, NBA players, WWE, gold medalists, and so many more. Rudy, thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. Thank you. Um, You know, I want to I want to talk about launch threat, rebuilding, relaunching a brand. But before we do, just talk about the mentality, training, training these elite athletes, NBA players, gold medalists. What's, you know, what were some of the things that you, because they were like, listen, Rudy, I've been trained by the best of the best. You know, why are you different? What was the mentality you came in with them when you were training them? Yeah, so it's funny. So it's kind of actually similar when you say that to their mentality versus when someone talks to me about hiring me for an agency, right? They're like, I've tried five agencies before, it never worked out. Same here, I tried blah, blah, blah before, didn't work out. And I think both times, the reason I've been successful in you know running big brands, running you know lots of stuff agency-wise versus elite athlete-wise is because I take a more holistic approach to everything, right? So with the athletes or with celebrities, I wouldn't just be a fitness trainer or a nutritionist. I had a sports science background. So I understood hormones, I understood sleep, I understood training, obviously, nutrition, obviously, supplementation. And that's kind of the ethos I took over to my marketing firm here, where we don't just do Facebook ads, or we don't just do Google ads, or we don't just write copy or build the CRMs and tech, right? We do a holistic approach uh, to the entire business, even down to the fulfillment, helping make sure that's set up and the, you know, helping make sure that the actual offer and the proposition and the avatar is all built out. Because without any of that, the little stuff doesn't work. Just like in elite sport, you can have the best athlete, but if the foundations are off biomechanically or nutritionally or hormonally or stress, cortisol, sleep, the athlete doesn't work like it should, okay? Just like the funnel, even if it's a world-class funnel, it won't work like it should if the offer isn't quite right or the Facebook ads aren't set up right or the back end isn't built out, okay? So it's more of that holistic approach, I would say, and understanding I was a chess champion as a child, so and I always come back to that, and I've even joked that I would love to one day build a business of just chess champions to see how it functions. You know, I was just on Masterclass the other day watching Gary Kasparov's Masterclass on chess. Okay, cool. Yeah. Be- so- because it applies to business, right? It applies well, to, to everything. 
the chess board is an ecosystem and it's about understanding what's happening there, what can happen. And if you make one move, what cascade of effects does that cause, right? And I think business is extremely similar and my ability to be able to understand that whole ecosystem from a bird's eye view when most people are in the weeds is what allowed me to be good in sports nutrition, sports science, good in business, good in marketing. So with chess, was it something that was natural for you or did you really have to practice? No, it was, yeah, I think my brain, you know, everyone's brain's different, right? Like everyone's body. Some people are born jumpers, some people are sprinters, some people are marathon runners, some people are wrestlers, right? It's kind of brains the same. Some people are creative, some people are logical, strategic, number, data driven, Um so yeah, I just started playing it as a kid at school in chess club, started winning chess club when I was like, you know, like a really young kid, I beat like the oldest in the whole school in annual chess tournaments. And I think, you know, it just suited my, my, how my brain functions. So Rudy, I want to talk about rebuilding a brand, but you know, there's also another piece of this, which is I'm, I'm wondering what some of the lessons you learned from your parents, because yeah. I don't know if most people know, but they are all uh, Olympic athletes, gold medalists. Yeah. What did so, you see with them? Yeah. So I was, it's funny because I was never born into money, even though they were very successful. 20 years ago, triathlon was the sport that um, my mom won a gold medal in. And even now, like I'm actually friends and two of my clients are the current Olympic gold medalists at triathlon. It's not a sport like the NFL or the NBA where you you know, you earn crazy money, right? It's better now, but 20 years ago, it was nothing except sponsorships, really. I think you won like 20 grand for being the best in the world, which is like insane. Um, but no, what I learned, I, so I learned like financially, you know, wasn't born into money or they weren't entrepreneurs. But I, I guess what I, I didn't, I wouldn't say I specifically learned something like, you know, that I can pinpoint. But if I look back from, what I saw of my parents, my mom trained for three different sports every day and worked and looked after me. And she was up at six, she would swim and bike, go to work, pick me up from school later. And then she'd go and train two more times and come home at nine, 10 p.m., eat and repeat the cycle, right? And that's kind of like how I was on Talk about dedication. Yeah. You know? that's how I, so, so that, you know, that I got to travel the world to all the races because triathlons are all over the world, you know, Mexico, Canada, all around the world, Hawaii, I went a bunch of times. So I got to spend a lot of time with elite athletes. And, you know, like, while I can't pinpoint like specific strategies that I necessarily learn, it's just more like, I think being surrounded in that environment growing up as a kid, right? That's probably what impacted me. And I think if I had to pinpoint it to one thing, I, I don't remember this, but my mom always has told me this since I became successful. She said, as a kid, I always told you you could do anything you ever wanted. So I think it's probably mm. that. Mm. Right? I mean, Rudy, like your subconscious is being trained yeah. as you're observing this. Yeah. Working hard, you know, just going after what you want, I imagine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. My mom was very, my mom, ironically, she was very old. She was in her 40s when she won. And most Olympic, you know, most top athletes are in their 30s or even nowadays their 20s. So the triathlon is an older sport. But again, you know, it's like defying the odds and, achieve, you know, if you set your mind to it and work hard and smart, you can do it, right? When you were young, Rudy, what did you want to be? Uh, so I was never like, I mean, you know, I always hear stories of kids saying as a, when they were young, they wanted to be like an astronaut or a doctor or something. And my mom's never, parents have never told me that I ever said anything like that. I did say that I wanted to move to America. Um, Why? I, I was obsessed with basketball and I came over to America a few times on vacation and I just loved, it just seemed more vibrant, more energized, bigger, bigger and better in life. Life seemed bigger out in America. And I was, you know, everyone says, oh, London's cool. Why would you want to leave England? Like London is like Manhattan. I didn't live in London. I lived in like Missouri equivalent. <laughs> you know, you got to remember, I was from, a, I was from like a, a decent sized city in England, but it's just a different mindset, right? And it's, yeah, much different moral mentality. Um, so I, yeah, back to your original question. Uh, I, I don't know if there was a specific thing I said, but I was always obsessed with money too. I was the kid that got banned from selling in school. I made my mom go to like 
the Sam's Club equivalent. Um, and I, she had to like get the business card from our friend who owned a mechanic shop just to get us into Sam's Club to then buy candy that I could then go. I made my dad set up a PayPal and the eBay account when I was like seven. When in the UK, no one even knew what that was, right? Because technology's behind. We, you know, we barely had a computer. Most houses didn't even have a computer when I was a kid. Um, and I was buying and selling on eBay. So I mean, it was just more the entrepreneur in me and the some for some reason the obsession with money was it a big deal for you when you start training and you love the nba you wanted to move to america training some nba players was yeah that was that was cool it was like it was more it was more with them it was more consulting um like virtually on nutrition supplementation so mm -hmm. it wasn't quite like as like you know in with them every day training them physically because they all have like a full team around them so i wasn't in that i was brought in as a consultant to look over their nutrition and supplementation regime that's still cool it was cool but the funny part was i actually drifted away from basketball back then so when i was doing it i wasn't a big basketball fan and i actually recently when covid hit and i stopped traveling i picked it up again and now i play every day and i'm obsessed with it again but mm -hmm. i went yeah so but yeah definitely cool to work with these people but just like anything in life you like once you start doing it a lot sadly it becomes kind of normal right so it's like yeah i remember the days when like half of my friends now in the entrepreneur space i was learning from them six years ago listening to their podcasts and like now i'm speaking on stage at their events and hanging out with them and they're my business partners and friends so and it's like you have to pinch yourself a few times and remember where you've come from. But I think most of us as entrepreneurs, we're always looking forward, not backwards, right? So you don't always appreciate that. Talk about that, Rudy, for a second. Some of the people that you learned from early on that now are your colleagues and you are speaking on their stages and, and doing business with them. Yeah. So I mean, like one of them is digital marketer, right? Like I they were the first courses and like podcasts I learned. And now I'm friends with Ryan Dice and all the, the owners of it. I, you know, I'm, I, I speak, I spoke at TNC, their biggest event. And I went to that event four years ago, um, five years ago when I didn't really know what any of this was. I always remember Ryan Moran. If you know Ryan Moran, I'm of capitalism.com. I think his was the first event I ever went to sat at, didn't know who Ryan was. Someone just said I should go there. And I was sat at the back of the room, had no clue. I think it was his first capitalism or second event, like five, six years ago. Didn't know a whole ton about marketing back then. I, I knew a decent amount, mainly Facebook ads. And then uh, I think mean, like two years ago, he became a client of mine. And then I was speaking on his stage and now he's a friend, right? And Ty Lopez, the obvious one, like I remember seeing his videos on YouTube five, six years ago. And Who hasn't like, seen his videos? Yeah, no. exactly. And then, you know, now now we speak every day and we're business partners. So it's just the evolution of, of life, you know, if you yeah. work hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I um, we hung out and I, you know, you spoke at uh, Stefan Georgie and Justin Goff's event, which you yeah. gave an, an amazing presentation. They have some killer stuff in the direct response uh, world. Um, how did you meet Ty Lopez? So I obviously started to kind of get to know him in the space. We spoke at events, similar events together. Um, but uh, there was kind of two ways eventually we got we got connected because he was looking to restart an agency. And I had a big agency that was pretty well known in the internet marketing world. So several people mentioned my name. And then uh, what well, actually two two people made the like actually kind of got everything moving was um, <clears throat> uh, one of my friends, Paul Getter. Um, he has a, a big marketing firm called The Nerds. He was helping Ty as a consultant and friend, connected us. Um, and then actually my, my uh, head copywriter and creative director was doing some consulting and copy for Ty too. So um, we just started, you know, meeting, talking, me and Ty built a relationship. And then eventually we started an agency together. Um, and that started to take off for a few months, but it was about two years ago or eight, just before we got like started getting dress barn and these other brands. So we kind of pivoted pretty quickly in a sense of, you know, our time and attention is now on these brands. And that's where I kind of work 14 hours a day is supporting, you know, ties on the front line. It's like a, we've got a nice setup ties on the front line, find the deals, 
Alex is in the middle between Ty and the brands and me, and then I'm like operating all the brands with with Alex and Ty and overseeing them. So let's talk about you know relaunch. Um, now you're you know kind of in a, a heading up Pure One. So what does yeah. that look like for you? I mean, it's a big company, right? That one is actually our biggest because we took it over. Uh, we took it over at like inception when it was just coming down, went into bankruptcy, but we relaunched right away. So, you know, a lot of these other brands, they dress bomb was similar, but linens and things is, you know, was got, was out of, you know, out of sales for a long time. So pier one's a much bigger one, uh, faster to regrow it, more going on, probably a stronger brand name because people, you know, it was, was really active, right? Just last year, I think to, uh, uh, yeah, 2019, as you see on the screen, over a billion, one and a half billion in revenue. Um, so yeah, it, it's great. I mean, it's all the challenges that you would expect of running a brand that is probably bigger than what most of us are used to in the internet marketing world, running a brand, you know, a brand like here, it's kind of, you have different issues and the issues are much bigger. <laughs> like I, I don't do a whole bunch in my agency now. I have a really great team there, about 50, 60 staff. Um, it's really, you know, I built it to be ran really well without me, which came at a good time, luckily, because of all of this. Um, and I'm still involved and work there daily, but I was saying to the head of ops um, and the director of marketing, I was like, you know, all of our small problems here are nothing. When I go and look at what I'm dealing with, with all these brands and not in a bad way, like these brands are in trouble that they're actually doing great since we took over them and we're making such tremendous strides forward with them. But it's just, it's just like anything, it's amplified, right? The bigger the brand, the bigger the problem, the bigger the revenue, the bigger the problems, the more money you make, more problems you get. But you're also eat better at dealing with them. What are some of the challenges? What are some examples of challenges? Just hyper growth, right? Hyper growth and building, um, you know, building the brand around hyper growth. I would say other challenges are um, you're taking over a brand at bankruptcy. It has its own set of challenges with like customer uh, experience because customers don't really understand that. So that's something you have to work hard on in the first year and make it clear that you know and even just some of your like vendors and stuff right there which i get like if they were selling as furniture before a company was building as furniture and company goes bankrupt sometimes the company goes bankrupt and the invoices are left right and then the even the vendors are hurt and that's not our liability because we take yeah. it as a new a new llc basically um but you have to re-establish those relationships too mm. Yeah, so, talk about that for a second, because I imagine trust is lost in the brand, even though you take over, and they're like, I don't know what I, I don't know if I want to do business with a company that stiffed me on lots of invoices. So how do you rebuild that? What do you do? It's not hard, right? We face these barriers, um, face these issues, and then we figure out an easy solution. Like we have, you just have to jump up. We, you know, just explain it, right? Basically, versus just pinging them an email you have to actually explain what's happened, right? And you have to explain, look, we we bought this company. There's nothing to do with us. None of the legacy founders or owners or directors are involved over here. We own retail e-commerce ventures. We have, you can see all the brands behind us. We're also ran from, you know, a team of marketing experts that have built e-commerce brands for 20, 30 years, 40 years combined since the internet basically started um and yeah we just kind of explain that explain that and and just you know show that we have multiple brands behind us and that you know and we and then we start small right sometimes like you know in terms of like net terms and stuff we might change and like make sure we pay them quicker and pay them in smaller chunks so yeah. you can build trust that way and it's just yeah it, you know you get obviously a couple are like no but it's been it's been fine. I mean, it's, it's a challenge. It was a challenge, but it's been fine. We've worked through it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's good. I mean, it's like, you just got to build trust slowly. Right. Yeah. Okay. And it starts with just those gestures of, okay, we're paying you on time and quick. Um, talk about, so, you know, you're an e-commerce guy, you are a direct response guy, you are a media guy. Um, 
So you take over Pier 1 and, you know, I know you love sales, right? So how do you look at what product should we keep or product should we not keep and then actually driving, you know, sales? What's the strategy as far as growth goes? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a big numbers guy, right? So I was a, as a science, sports scientist, you're also a data scientist, whatever, what, you know, whatever science field you're in. If I worked in a lab as a researcher, so you have to become very good at data and spreadsheets. And I was also very good at math. So it's easy for me. So I'm a data guy. So I just come in at all these brands and I look at the data. What's the top sellers? What are the best net margins? And it's like right there. It's like common sense. If, and the hardest part of any brand, and I think the thing that separates me from most marketers and entrepreneurs is the, the my appreciation for the data and how I uh, bury it into my team to a point where if they're not on board, they get fired. So in my businesses, I have data dashboards that show me every single number you could ever imagine for every single thing I ever need that's updated hourly that I can get with a click of a button. And what I've what I found, the reason I can build brands and actually they function without me, and I was sharing this at um, another cup, I actually shared this at my talk at Traffic and Conversion, was when the data is so clean and presented uh, to everyone in the business, it's also, it, it's almost so, it's idiot proof because I literally like, I even asked my team, I'm like, you know, like here's the daily report what should we do? And if something's made 20 grand and something's lost five grand and one webinar lead is worth a thousand dollars a phone call and one funnel is only getting you $200 per phone call in average revenue generated, what should we scale? And anyone can say, Oh, you probably should do more of the one. <laughs> you right. know? That's how I try and build these businesses. So even in peer one, I come in, first two weeks i just became obsessed with all the numbers all the data all the financials and i have like the team just building all these crazy reports um and they probably think i'm insane but like now it works because now everyone's like oh we should send an email with more of these products with the highest net margins that are also the highest net sellers and oh we did a hundred grand here but by the time we pay shipping cost of goods we hardly made any profit. So we probably should do less of this and like more of this. So I, that's what I try and do because then it's just easy. Business becomes easy when you do that. Like yeah. at, at least the marketing and the scaling side of business, there's a lot more that goes into business around operations, teams, legal, fulfillment, blah, blah, blah. Right. But that side of it, I think the data is a big part of it. Um, I love the 80 20 approach. You know, you look at what's the whatever it could be 95 five. What's the top 5% that's going to lead the 95% growth? And you look at the top sellers, you look at net margins. What are some of the other key metrics or data that you're looking at? Um, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you go granular in the data, EPC and net EPC, most people ignore that one. And that one is actually the most important. So that's earnings per click. And then also if you have fulfillment, it's net earnings per click. And I actually had the team run this report for one of the brands. I don't want to give too many details away for confidentiality. But, um, you know, and it was actually very eye-opening for the team because they, like, they gave me a report. And it wasn't quite clear on what categories were the best sellers, what was the best one to scale. And it had great metrics that every marketer would look for. It had conversion rate, it had revenue, AOV. It had, uh, yes, yeah, so it had conversion rate, AOV. So two of the key metrics, right? But it still wasn't really clear, like, which one should we really scale? So mm -hmm. they're now going to add in EPC and then net EPC after COGS. And it was like, we all sat on a screen share for four minutes and did it. And it was like wildly obvious, like the EPC mm. was kind of a little obvious, but then you have COGS. And then when we did net EPC with COGS, it was like one category was 300% higher in net revenue than all the rest. And wow. it was, it's just, you know, that again, you have to it, dig deep into that. So like for people listening, you know, the conversion rate, the average AOV, the average order volume, right? If someone's buying you know, whatever, a hundred as opposed to $50. And then you're digging into the earnings per click and then the net earnings per click. But get this. So, so uh, again, I can't give away too many details, but the highest, the highest uh, AOV 
was actually one of the worst net EPC and the thirty dollar the lowest EP the lowest AOV was the highest net EPC. Wow. <laughs> and if you just go off of AOV, you're like, oh, let's scale the AOV, but it wasn't profit as profitable. Ninety nine percent of people would have made that mistake and they literally mm. would have grown an entire business for six months based off the one one four minute mistake. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it looks good, right? Because it produces a lot of, you know, gross revenue, but it's not profitable. Yeah. And now look, look if you're selling info products and courses, it's a little simpler and you're probably safer with AOV. But for us in a, a physical company, especially when it's like some of our companies are clothing, electronics, furniture, you have more logistical stuff. You have fulfillment costs of that. You have large packet extra charges and that's the stuff I have to now account for that I didn't when I was selling nineteen dollar fitness ebooks. I had return refund rate and that was two percent and three percent credit card fees and then I had Facebook ad fees and that was it, right? So we really talk to me um, maybe like an overarching strategy. So so you know the the company's like, okay, Rudy, we just bought Radio Shack. Let's run with it. And that's what do you do? Yeah, Alex will call me on a Sunday night. <laughs> it will be because, you know, there's a long process leading up to it. Ty and Alex do more of the buying and the acquisition side. Like I'm more on the operation marketing side, which is great because that Alex has sold uh, to, you know, he sold Zeus for a quarter of a billion dollars. So he's gone, you know, he's been there, done that. And Ty is super experienced in that side. I'm not. And I'll get there. Like that's probably the next phase is me helping with that one day. But, we also have to make sure all the brands we're buying are operated. So I, you know, I place, I have a very valuable role on this side of it. So, but it will be back to your question. It will be, you know, I, they'll obviously tell me early on the plan. Like I already know a major brand now, one of the biggest in the world that we're working on that I, I can't share because it's confidential, but it will, you know, and they'll keep me updated. Like it's going to this phase, blah, blah, blah. It's with attorneys. It might go to auction. And then it will be like, now I know, I know we're close. And then it will be, you know, like we have calls every day. So you never know, but it's like, I'll answer it. And like, it'll be, it'll be like, so, or something, you know, one key word. And then it'll be like, we won Radio Shack. So get ready. You're going to get the keys in two days. <laughs> and like, then, turn it on. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, to, to answer the question, it starts like that. And then it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot in a few, it's a lot in the first few weeks because you're taking over. I mean, if you bought any brand, it's a lot, right? You're trying to take over logins, figure out the brand, the analytics, all the stuff. And when it's a brand that's like been a big public brand, it's just even more, right? There's more legal stuff. Like uh, Radio Shack has like 70 tr international trademarks around the world and licenses and patents and stuff like it's stuff like that that you know i've never experienced before figuring working with attorneys there some of them you have to work with another set of attorneys on who can you now email and text versus who has to re-opt in for compliance and then it's just all kinds of wild stuff like that right and it's just like there's two examples of stuff that we might not have to deal with every day as normal marketers with ecom like our own e-com brands, right? Yeah. And, uh, and but it, and it's like anything in life. You like, I think a good analogy is, you know, when you walk into like a bedroom and it's so messy, it's like, where do I start? But if you just start, by the end of the day, it's clean, and you just like have to. You, sometimes you're just like, I just got to start somewhere, and it like it just falls into place as long as you're strategic and organized. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm wondering, like, thirty thousand square foot view you're starting once you kind of see you know the clouds part a little bit you're cleaning stuff up i'm wondering your methodology so yeah, you may I, go cool like i'm gonna build a, i'm gonna look at these specific numbers i'm gonna build a dashboard like what are the things you're doing yeah, yeah. next before you get to the fun stuff like the marketing stuff right because yeah. you have to do all that other not maybe so yeah so, i mean you've got to get products on there right because sometimes we take over stock sometimes we take over no inventory so we got to reestablish that. That's a big part of it, reestablishing with vendors and getting products and stock on there. We have to um, rebuild the e-com site. And we use my agency a lot to do a lot of that. And we have internal teams. But 
with my agency and the internal team we have for all the brands, we know it's more turnkey, right? Because we've done it, well, eight times now, or however many times I lose track of how many brands we've got. Um, and obviously, my agency's done thousands of sites, but specifically for these e-com brands, it's more turnkey at this point. So we, you know, we build, rebuild the site or take over the current site. We get all the ad accounts set up. Um, we look at the team because sometimes we take over a lot of, we don't have to, but sometimes we'll hire a lot of the old employees. Sometimes we'll hire new employees um, and we'll lean on our current team as well to get stuff started. Um, yeah, we'll look through the data, the analytics. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, like not day one, I'm probably not building these dashboards. I'm like trying to get stuff rolling and just get some traffic there, looking at the email list looking at the best emails they've sent, how the automations are built out. Um, and yeah, just kind of piecing all that together, trying to get some, once you've got products on there, getting some ads on, and then it's just like stepping stones after that, right? So like what's next, what's next? And you know, before you know it, 30, 60, 90 days in, you're in control of everything, it's going well, and you're scaling it up. Do you have an email platform? I imagine you probably... Uh, um inherit a lot of these different softwares they're already sending emails to this system and this system what what email systems do you prefer do you bring them on like as we far use, as that yeah, goes we use because it's shopify we use clavio because it just integrates so well with shopify right what have you has anything surprised you as you've gone in you're looking under the hood of some of these brands of some of the emails or design or or things that have converted because you've probably seen so many campaigns at this point yeah, I mean, a lot surprised me, and I, I, I live by a, a an ethics code, which I share with the team, is because there was a lot of time of like, oh, this is not what Pier 1 used to do. And I have this one rule, I'm like, never follow a billion dollar brand that went bankrupt. If they did that, let's do the opposite at this end of the spectrum. So I often have to remind people of that. So uh, I'd send to, you know, and I'm not saying all these brands are bad, they did a lot of great stuff. But just in general, it's like you have to forget the old way and like do the new way, right? So there's some great stuff, you know, there's some great stuff in there and there's some stuff that you're just amazed at, right? Some of the brands take weeks to send out emails and get organized, whereas internet marketers, we want to send out an email, we send our tech guy a Slack message, send this, and five minutes later it's being sent out, right? So I think that's a big part of it that we bring is that speed and that pivoting and that testing ethos that a lot of us entrepreneurs have that big brands don't have because they have so many hoops to jump through, right? If you want an email sent in corporate, it has to go like plan two weeks early because it's got to go through like eight people to get approved. Um, but yeah, in terms of what does well, the biggest thing that I've found, not just even in these brands, but in all the brands that I run, like my own personal brands and my clients under the agency, is like it, it always comes back to the hook and the offer. The more and more and more I've done of this, it's the hook and the offer. Like three, four years ago, I was like, it's the ads, it's the copy. Now I'm like, it's the hook and the offer. And I know this to be true because... Well, Justin and Stefan just love that you said that. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> but you can almost, and they might not love this part as much, but I think you can even have pretty bad copy. If the hook and the offer is insane, then it sells itself. And I, I know that's true in the e-com side because these brands, you know, you, you look at the emails and the ads, none of them, look at any big brand in America. The one, the, the Facebook ads you see that have thousands of likes and shares, none of them have this long copy that pulls on emotion and then urgency and taps all the, you know, ticks all the boxes on what's great copy. It's just either a really cool, great product at a great price, probably with some sort of flash sale, or it's not, right? So that's kind of, and you can take the hook and the offer, you know, in the marketing world with funnels, the copy is sure, it's more important. But even in my own business, we test a lot of hooks, you know, and offers, and it's all it, 90 percent the hook and the offer like i can throw up a page with two hours of copy and a two minute video less copy an hour of copy or no copy a headline a sub headline a video and if the hook and offer is strong it'll scale if it's weak it won't and i can have my best copywriter spend a week writing a sales page if the hook and the offer is not perfect then that sales page will still flop right 
So I think I, they would agree with that. I mean, the hook yeah. is part of the copy and everything. But yeah. so what would be an example, Rudy, of a um, a hook and offer that you just saw convert, you know, do really well? Well, so a good example is my two, <clears throat> my three top selling courses that have all done millions of dollars alone um, in my own brands is my, my first fitness one that made me my first millions was a 90 day bikini plan. Okay. Okay. And it still sells this day, hundreds of thousands of copies sold. And the ironic part is I wrote that sales page. I remember I wrote the sales page on an iPad. I had one Indian developer at $5 an hour on Upwork code the page. I was on an iPad at the pool in Orlando when my dad and his family came to visit from the UK. And the copy was not great. It's still not great, but I've had world-class copywriters, including myself, try and rewrite it with a new hook and lead in and flow and more long form, no one's ever beat it. It's like, because it's the hook and the offer. Okay. And it's not even that cool. It's 90 day bikini plan. It's not like this, you know, game changing hook and offer, but that, that was an example. In what was more, the offer there? So the, the hook is like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's just $19 and you get everything, all your meal plan, you get meal plans, training plans, supplement plans, and, you know, it's a 90 day bikini plan. And, you know, a bit of the hook is I'm a leading sports scientist and I'm teaching you about hormones and more advanced mechanisms that no one else does. And that's why you're going to get results. Hmm. But it's a prime example of that hook and offer. It's just just led the way and it's never been beaten. And I've launched I probably split tested 40 of a uh, fitness funnels in the last few years, like over the years and nothing ever beat it. You know, um, Rudy, I know we have a few more minutes here. I would love to hear, you know, this is, you just, it's kind of a throwaway comment. Yeah. Like I spend a few hours a month and I built this 60 person agency, you know, that's, you know, a huge well, deal. Yeah. And, yeah. and I want to talk about just a few things that you, that were key for you to systemize in that agency. Cause most people yeah. can't step out of that, that role. So well, and don't get me wrong. I spent 16 hours a day of tremendous stress, blood, sweat, yes. tears for three years to get it to this. No, point. I get it totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I guess to answer the question, like, look, I it comes back to the chess stuff, right? That I'm see the big picture. I'm systematic. I'm strategic, and I try to build at least now, not years ago, but I try to build all my businesses to to do that. So I want to empower my staff. Hire great. It's it's all about the people, right? You hear that saying a lot. But I make sure I have a great team. I make sure I have good staff. I make sure I have really good systems. And most importantly, I build my systems. If you go back to the homepage, all my staff are at the bottom too. Um, but I make sure. Um, yeah, there's one one page I was trying to get to where they're all wearing ROI machines shirts. I love I think, that. I think at the bottom. Oh, uh, at the bottom. Okay, cool. Yeah. But but. Um, what I was saying is I build the systems and the training for my team in based on my brain. So it's like I almost build my brain into, oh, I know what you're talking about. If you go to about an FAQ, yeah, top header, I mean, it's the the careers page probably. Um, yeah. yeah. No, this is what I was looking for. Yeah, they all have, I'm an ROI machine. Yeah, so yeah, we do yeah. four we do quarterly retreats. So I fly everyone from around the world into Orlando. I get two or three big mansions and we have a week together. I mean, we haven't since COVID, but yeah. Uh, but it's like I build my brain and my strategy into the into the team and into my own systems. Okay. So then it's still me running the business because it's my brain, but it's like I've taught them and built a system where they can run run the day-to-day -day of that brain for me, right? So I'm not like following up is this task done is this sent out did we do this did we do this right so yeah you've got to build great teams great systems hire great people and then um just figure out where your unique area of genius is and then spend your time there and then eventually if you want to fully step out you've got to find hire someone really good on a really high salary that's super experienced to fill that last gap that only you could fill and those mm. I think a lot of entrepreneurs get, can get close to that part, but they can most can't ever do that part because it's so hard to do that. What helped you do that? <sighs> um, I think a lot of us have an internal like fear slash mindset barrier that we can find that person. 
And I think for me, uh, like I've always said, like I, I love marketing, I love the agency, but it's not my life. Like it's not going to be my legacy in my life. It's going to be a business I have. I built for a few years that I want to keep running, but I'm not, I don't want to be doing this in five, 10 years. And I got to a point where it was pretty built out. It was doing well. We had a great team. I hired a kind of director of performance. Um, his name's Sean. He has like, he worked with Agora for eight years, has a bunch of copy and experience background there, marketing strategy. Um, and, you know, I was, I was kind of at a point where I was like, I mean, you just got to like cold turkey it. So I was like, I'm like, and all the stuff was happening with the new brand. So it was like a good time because it, it was kind forced of you forced a little. So I was like, you know, and even a couple of my staff, you know, I remember one of my staff was like really scared. She's like, really, I don't think we, you should do this. What happens if it will crumble? It's and scary. Like, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I'm like, what's, what's the worst that can happen? Let's do it. And you, you, like the the staff and the team and the systems are good enough to notice if the issues start to arise. It's yeah. not like you're going to walk out. Well, firstly, I never walked out. I still check in and I still help and I still provide the strategy for clients, which is the the eighty twenty. But it's something I can do in five minutes or in the first call, and then it's set right, and the team can action it. Um, and, and yeah, it's like, I, I'm very proud. It's work. The agency runs just as well without me as it did with me. Rudy, thank you so much. I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone should check out your websites, ROIMachines.com. You could check out what they're working on at retail commerce, uh, retail e-commerce ventures.com. And thanks so much, Rudy. Yeah, You're pleasure. awesome. Great. Yeah. All right. Thank you. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.